How are you all? Good. You good? Yeah. Is this water for me? Or yeah. can I have it? At least? Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. I haven't done anything to it. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're okay. It's okay. It's just water. <laughs> um, this morning, uh, I'm just continuing through a series of Living by Faith. So, the last series we looked at, we looked at the values that we have, uh, that kind of are behind us as a church, as Wayne Family Church, and um, uh, hopefully you all got to discover that the values that we hold as a church, we didn't just pick from thin air, but actually it's uh, kind of been, um, it's, it's been passed along to us as we have been a part of New Frontiers and Narrow Commission, and the family churches that we're connected to, that it's kind of it's a part of our DNA, if you like, a part of our history, um, the, the values that we hold. So during the series of talks about values, I talked about the value of community and loving community and being in community. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to talk about living by faith as a community. So it's a kind of a, a continuation, if you like. Not that I expect any of you have any great memory of what I said before, but you know, if, if you want to, you can look back and then to compare what I'm saying. Um, so to do this, um, we're going to be looking in Acts 2 and verse 42, where it says this, and they, the believers, um, at that time devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, I, I, I have to um, also um, apologise. I usually give myself an opportunity to read through everything that I've written. I've not had this opportunity. So if I pause, that is why um, I may just need a minute just to collect my thoughts. But um, we're going to start right at the beginning of this verse. And the first word of this verse, so we're going to start with and, but don't worry, we're not going to meticulously go through this verse word by word, we're just going to, but we are going to pause here just for a minute, and it really is a tip for anyone who's reading the Bible, if, you, if you're new to reading the Bible, that if you see a word like and, and I'm sure you will all remember this from, from your English lessons, that it's a kind of conjunction. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> it's a conjunction. So it's a part of a, like a, a bigger phrase. Some big ideas that are kind of split into two parts almost. So if you see an and, perhaps you should just move on and see what the and is saying, but it's worth seeing what, it, what it's saying beforehand to get some context behind what is actually being said. So we're going to do that very briefly. I'm not going to read um, Acts 2 to you. I'm just going to summarise. And... At Acts 2, we have a moment in the Bible called the Day of Pentecost, where all the believers of Jesus were gathered together, and the Bible describes a sound like a rushing wind filling the room that they were in, and they became filled with the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who are unsure of who the Holy Spirit is, is the part of God that when Jesus died and ascended, it was promised to remain with the believers. If you're still not sure what I'm talking about, please come and grab me at the end, or um, anyone else hopefully will be able to help you with that. But when you read about the Holy Spirit, it tends to talk about, use words like um, associated to liquid. So the Bible says that believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they became filled with the Holy Spirit, some miraculous stuff happened in the believers, or to the believers, which, um, which gave them, amongst other things, boldness. And it emboldened Peter, one of the disciples, to um, deliver a sermon that culminated in 3,000 people being saved and baptised. And the, out of those 3,000 people, not all of them stayed in that place, but they went off to, in, into different areas 
but some of them remained in Jerusalem where they were and started a local church. And this is where our and comes into play. So why do I highlight this? Because if you're a believer in Jesus and you're a part of the community here at Wager Family Church, then hopefully, my hope is, that you've experienced firsthand that and moment. That hopefully you recognise this scenario some way in your own life. That there was a time that you didn't know Jesus, but then you did know Jesus. And when you met Jesus, you either considered yourself already a part of us, or you joined us, or you joined another church. And this is really important, I feel. Firstly because I've met some Christians who come across as very, uh, very kind of spiritual, very kind of, um, very knowledgeable. And they come across and they may say things like, oh, do I go to church? Well, well, I don't really do that because, well, I'm a part of the universal church, um, you, you know. Or, well, I'm always connected to church because church is wherever I am, that's where church is. And, this, and I've come across this, I don't know if you have yourself, I've come across this from time to time. And the interesting thing is this, it's like a, a peppering of truth in some of those statements. But, I feel that it's not a completely biblical view, and that in fact it's quite wrong. Really, we don't read that people became believers and then they were left to their own devices to figure out their faith independently. You won't really see that in scripture. And secondly, it doesn't demonstrate your faith at work um, and, and the work that Christ has done in you if you're not willing to be connected to a, to a church family. Did I say that right? Did you get that? Now what I'm talking about, if you're not quite sure, is that being in a family is tough at times. Do you know what I mean? Yeah? That's cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure many of us can relate to this feeling. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps you've even thought to yourself, if, uh, if only I... I lived by myself. I don't know if perhaps some of you do live by yourself, but if you live in a busy family or you know, with someone else, you might think to yourself, if only I live by myself, because I'll be able to find everything that I need. Because no one's going to be moving stuff around or, or changing things and making me feel frustrated. Sometimes we can have these feelings. In our house, it's mostly around the dishwasher. Um, I have all the important jobs in the house, so it's my job to do the washing up. I hope that I would have been upgraded by now to a, you know, a more sophisticated job, but no, this is, for 14 years, I'm still waiting for the, uh, the promotion to something more, but it's dishwasher. But whenever someone else has touched the dishwasher, I have to kind of make a point to say, I mean, do you want to come here and have a look at this? Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's these little spikes that are going up in a row that's perfect for plates. Uh, what, what, what would possess you to put a cup where clearly a plate needs to be? And, and I know it's a bit silly, but being in church sometimes can be equally as challenging like that. Yeah? And when these challenges arise, um, it's, it causes us to lean into Christ and his faithfulness to know how we need to be towards each other to help us grow. Is it fundamental for your salvation that you need to be in a church? No. But if you want to grow out of being a baby follower of Christ and grow in maturity, then the only way this is going to happen is by joining a church. There is no other way. So we're going to go back into 
back into this scripture in Acts 2. I'm going to unpause from the and, and right at the start of the verse, and I want to be clear, because I want to be clear as, as we start to go through this, where we are, what we're talking about when we're talking about community is this, that we're a faith-filled community of believers in Jesus Christ, that we've met, we've met with his death, his resurrection power, and that we're connected through this event. And our and we are living lives together that are shaped by him. So that's what we're talking about. That's the introduction. So we've had our and. The next part is they devoted themselves. Um, when I was, I don't think there's any chance we could bring up Acts 2 onto the screen, so I don't know how that's done. I'm really sorry, I should have, perhaps we should have, <laughs> that would be helpful because we're really like going through it bit by bit, so perhaps it would be good for people to see. When I was um, 14, I, um, I went to a school in London, it was a dance school, um, as you can all tell by looking at me, I used to do ballet. And, and um, I remember we, um, we took a school trip and uh, we went to Regent's Park to see A Midsummer Night's Dream. And it was great. And um, as you do when you're 14, you're kind of by yourself, the teacher's not really looking. You thought, I'm going to go and have a little wander around. Well, the teacher's not looking. So I go for a wander around. And suddenly I see this group of people that are kind of protesting um, outside a building. And I get curious about it and I start wandering around. It turns out, and, and from what I remember, I think it was, a pro it was a protest about General Pinochet. And this is a kind of South African dictator. And um, so I kind of get in the, no? South American. South American, what did I say? South, I meant South American, apologies, I did mean South, South American. Sorry, Jay. No, no, it's fine, please correct me. Please do. <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah, so anyway, I'm getting into this crowd, and they've all kind of got, you know, they're getting really into it, and they're obviously there's a lot of emotion behind what they're doing. They're very passionate, and I'm just kind of passively wandering around, just kind of going, what is all this that's kind of going on? And I tell you this because it's the exact opposite picture of what Acts 2 is. That the, that the believers uh, didn't behave like this when they were forming the church. There were no bystanders spectating, wandering around, looking and thinking to themselves, what, what is this all about? It says that they devoted themselves. It's, uh, sorry, yeah, just verse 42. That they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So I went onto a website when I was doing some, um, some learning around this, and um, I, I managed to stumble across a long-time New Frontiers leader called David Devonish. I don't know if any of you have heard of him at all, but I can highly recommend David Devonish, if um, you want to uh, look up some really good teaching. And he gives a definition about this word devoted, and it's this. It's being attached, attached to someone like a friend, faithful like a dog with his master, always standing ready and available like a fire engine. <laughs> Not my words. David Devonish's. Busily engaged in, like work. Continue, persevere, like climbing a mountain. Or spending time in, like an athlete training. And I wonder if any of those um, definitions, any of those sentences, can relate about how you feel about Wayne Family Church. Do you feel attached? Do you feel like you're standing ready and available, busy and engaged in. This is how the early church did it, did church. This is how they did it. They devoted themselves. 
Here in Acts 42, it gives us four activities that the early church devoted themselves to doing. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, bre baking, no, no, breaking of bre bread, not baking of bread, and the prayers. So we're going to look at the first one, we're going to look at teaching. And what is apostolic teaching? Well, last time I think I talked about um, community, apostle came up then also. Um, but when we talk about apostolic teaching, um, it says what we're referring to is the teaching that was delivered by the 12 apostles, 11 of which were disciples who followed Jesus. And you can read about them in the Gospels in the New Testament. So the early church devoted themselves to the lived experiences and guidance on how Jesus wanted to live from the people who learned from him. And later, those people went on to either directly or indirectly write down that teaching, and so we now have the New Testament. And this is considered apostolic teaching. And, and really, it's the exact goal of here at Wayne Family Church, and unashamedly so, that we are as near as we can be a community who are faithful to that teaching. Are we perfect? Oh, thanks, Beth. <laughs> Beth said no. <laughs> We are. <laughs> uh, no, we're not perfect, by the way. Um, but um, not by any means. You know, there are some practical church-based activities that we do that you simply cannot find in apostolic teaching. You cannot find it in the Bible. Shock horror. <laughs> Things like a membership course. I don't think there's no mention of a membership course in... Uh, in the Bible. Am I right? I don't, I don't think you'll find that passage. Anyway, if people signing up to be a member of a church, you won't find that in the Bible as far as, away, as far as I'm aware. But there are justifications for us having a membership that's scripturally based and it's based on the, um, the apostolic teaching that we have in the New Testament. One is Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. As those who will, have, who, who will have to give an, give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. Or 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you brothers by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that, you, that all of you agree. And that there will be no divisions among you. That you may be united in the same mind and the same judgment. In this way, the leadership course, as an example, is a useful tool for achieving what is described there in apostolic teaching. The, uh, the membership course is an opportunity to establish who we are as a church to individuals, so that as a community of believers, we can feel united in common values and being of the same mind as each other about matters of faith. Having a leadership or a, a, a membership um, course also gives both Tony and Mick a sense of who they have a level of responsibility for as elders of Wayne Family Church. So understanding and aligning with apostolic teaching within the Bible is fundamental to what we want to achieve in being a faith-filled community. It's not to say there aren't many churches with similar goals, and it's, um, it's probably worth saying that's why there are so many churches available and around today. Um, you know, and, yeah, I think we're going to skip past that. Um, So I know, I know there's many Christians who in fact say, you know, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago where um, it was talked about, shouldn't we just kind of forget 
um, about the differences that we have and just get on and work together. Now, I'm going to be careful here because I'm sure there's many of us who feel that way, and to a certain degree, I do. I agree with that sentiment. We should be working together as much as we can, but there are differences between how churches approach some matters of faith that will make it difficult for us to work together at times. And that being said, we do have excellent relationships with other churches in the town. And in fact, we've, had, we've got long time, well-established inter-church programs, mostly based around social action, that we are an active part of, and it's evidence of that type of collaboration. And the argument, well, could be then, well, let's just be a community that gets on with everyone, and if it's just a few challenges or differences of opinion, we can just brush that to one side. Why, why are you being so unreasonable? We're not being unreasonable or challenging when we say that we want to establish a, um, the, the teaching in the way that we feel is in line with the Bible. It's not us being unreasonable. We are devoting ourselves to the truth and to apostolic teaching. And truth has taken a big hit in society. I'm sure you'd all agree. You know, a couple of years ago, it's, it's interesting doing, doing a, um, I'm, I'm doing a, some study at the moment, and when I was doing my undergraduate degree, we were talking a lot about postmodernism. It's maybe something that you've come across. It's an ideology where you're kind of challenging and deconstructing worldviews and philosophies, thought and power. But now we've moved from postmodernism into post-truth. Where post-truth is, we've arrived in a post-truth era when alternative facts replace actual facts and feelings have more weight than evidence. And this is clearly evident in the world that we live in at the moment, particularly in politics. I'm sure you'd all agree with that. But we don't need to fear this new reality of truth being um, coming under attack. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. There's been numerous times in history when faith has been under fire, so to speak. And we can think of the early church and the Roman Empire as it was persecuting Christians. Um, the Enlightenment era, with the birth of modern science and philosophy, Postmodernism, as I said, and many other places and times in history when truth and biblical truth was challenged. Challenged. We should not be put off or surprised that our truth is under so much suspicion, and in many cases derision. Is that word? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's word. <laughs> Guys, in fact, it's my hope that we may learn to lean into some of this difficulty as we work, as we're together as a community and we're working out this faith, that we lean into this new reality, at least with the view to win people. Can you imagine feeling that there is no truth? Wow. There are some desperate people out there who are seeking truth. And what do I mean by leaning into it? Does that mean that we reject truth? I'm kind of hoping that by now I've established that truth is really important to us. We're not going to reject it. But I mean this. And, and this, is, uh, this is Paul. He says this. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. That I might win those outside the law, to the weak I became weak, that I may win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Guys, let's not be put off by the fact that, yes, truth is under attack. We can still stand strong in our faith and engage with people about our truth 
and win people. A final look a little bit about um, about teaching and uh, our community is this. I found this as a John Calvin quote. I don't know if any of you know 